In the Arctic, there's two kinds of ice. Some of the ice forms at the shore, and it builds out to sea. And then there's pack ice. The pack ice floats free. In the wintertime, the shore ice and the pack ice meet. Everything freezes over solid. But other times of the year, there's an open channel of water between the shore ice and the pack ice. Beluga whale will swim through these open channels of water. They've got to swim through open water because they're mammals, right? They're not fish. They can't just bump up against the ice. They've got to get their blowholes to the surface so they can breathe. Polar bears. Polar bears will lie at the edge of these open channels of water, their bellies and snouts flat on the ice, and they'll just lay there, stock still, for hours. When a beluga swims past the polar bear through the open channel of water, the bear will punch the whale. Literally, punch the whale in the front of the head, knock it out, and then roll it up onto the ice. Let me repeat that. <laughs> a polar bear, a single 10 foot long, 1600 pound animal, this bear would punch a whale. <laughs> a 20 foot long, 3,500 pound whale. This bear would punch a whale in the head, knock it out, and then lift it out of the water. This is not an animal. This bear is a god. <laughs> I, well, li literally, for the, for the Eskimo, the polar bear is Nanook. Now, in the Central Park Zoo, we have a polar bear in a glass cage. This exhibit, this, uh, this exhibit is about 5,000 square feet. Now, in the wild, the polar bear's natural home range is 31,000 square miles. That's the size of South Carolina. This kind of blew me away, so I decided to try to get my head around it. I, I, I do a comparison. I figured I'd do some math. So for this comparison, I decided to say that my natural home range was the island of Manhattan, 23.7 square miles. Okay, so you take the polar bear from his 31,000 square mile home and you put him in a 5,000 square foot cage. And you take me from my 23.7 square mile Manhattan home and you put me in a cage that's proportionate to the polar bear's cage. And you'll put me in a cage that it's 3.8 square feet. That's the size of this handkerchief. and I'll live the rest of my life in this handkerchief-sized cage. This polar bear god excerpt is an example of my lifetime project, The Unreliable Bestiary. Inspired by the literary concept of the unreliable narrator and the medieval bestiary, which gave every living thing a spiritual purpose, the project is an arc of stories about animals, our relationships with them, and the worlds they inhabit. In addition to a set of books and a website, The Unreliable Bestiary will present a performance for each letter of the alphabet, each letter represented by a particular animal, or habitat, or idea. A is for arc. In case of the extinction of a species or the planet, the DNA arc is collecting the DNA of every organism on Earth. B is for bear. C is for continent. Passenger pigeons blacken the sky. Oceanic herds of bison blanketed the plains. And now, a continent of plastic, twice the size of Texas, swirls in the North Pacific, a dead zone mirroring the South Pacific doldrums, where the 19th century whale ship Essex was destroyed by an angry white whale. M is for monkey. In 2009, we, we opened Monkey on Darwin's 200th birthday. The piece wove together myth, science, monologues, PowerPoint lectures, dance, and video. We made Monkey for a black box theater, but other performances will take place in specific sites, such as living rooms, circus tents, national park amphitheaters, and places like the Stock Pavilion at the University of Illinois. Our next animal is wolf. You see, I'm skipping around the alphabet. We're kind of starting with animals we all started, grew up with, from cartoons, our, our storybooks, and fairy tales. 
This past September, E was for elephant. Now, when I was growing up, our backyard neighbors were the Clingers. And the father worked at Honeywell designing torpedoes. His name was Dick. Dick Klinger. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <clears throat> His kids were afraid of him. If they did anything wrong, they'd get spanked. If they did anything really wrong, they would get the belt. Now, kids getting beaten with belts by torpedo designers with names like Dick Klinger might have been common in the 50s, but ideas about raising children evolve. Today, the belt? Well, no, that's a bad idea. Now, for my dad, raising kids was sort of like training golden retrievers. Now, today, there's a couple of schools that thought about raising dogs. You have the owners that have the collars where the slightest tug on the leash digs three-inch spikes into the neck of the dog. Then you have the owners that have read the book written by dog training monks. All positive reinforcement, all love, because dog backwards is God. So I'm thinking that training an elephant is like training golden retrievers. Now, I've heard that if you take a baby elephant, you chain it to a heavy, sturdy stake, the baby's helpless, but then it grows up gets big and strong. There aren't any stakes that could hold an elephant. But the elephant is absolutely convinced it can't do anything about the stake or the chain because that's what it learned as a baby. And an elephant never forgets. Now for this project, I wanted to see some elephants. Not in a circus, not in a zoo. Now way back in the day, people used to say to each other, hey, did you see the elephant? Meaning, did you see whatever was the most spectacular part of whatever metaphorical circus you were visiting? But I didn't want to see metaphors, I wanted to see elephants. In the States, you got a couple of elephant sanctuaries. You got one in Tennessee, you got one in California. So I called them up, see if I could visit or volunteer, but mostly I, I wanted to see the elephants. Pretty much everybody that calls these places wants to see the elephants. But the whole point of these sanctuaries is for the elephants. It's not for the people to see the elephants. There's no training with spikes. There's no training with optimistic monks. There's no training at all. It's all elephant, all the time. I read this book called War Elephants. The author thanked the people in his Mahout training course. And I thought, huh, what's that? A Mahout? He's the lifelong human companion of a working Asian elephant. In three days, the Thai Elephant Conservation Center will train you to be a Mahout while you experience the life of Mahouts and elephants firsthand in a natural environment. And I thought, great, sign me up. Well, right from the start, it was complicated. You got language, you got translation. Even signing up for the course was complicated. Here's something simple. In the United States, when we get together and have a white elephant party, we give each other white elephants. Useless crap. White elephant, bad. But in Southeast Asia, it is a stroke of very good fortune for a king to discover and capture a white elephant during his reign. A white elephant was supposed to have impregnated the queen that gave birth to the Buddha. White elephant, good. It's tradition. Traditional elephant training in Thailand is called Fajan. It is golden retriever training with spikes. The elephant is beaten any time it does anything that is not commanded and rewarded every time it does something that is commanded. It is never given the chance to make a decision because then it might get the idea that it had some power or strength. So, while the mahout provides the beatings, the mahout also provides the sweet bananas, the sugar cane, the mud, the baths. The mahout provides everything. Everything, everything, everything. Heaven and hell. So if you think about it, you don't have to think long. The only reason anyone can ride any elephant at all is because they are trained. So while the five-year-old in me was thinking, I'm on an elephant, the 46-year-old in me knew that the only reason I was on this elephant is probably because it's had the crap beaten out of it. Did I do the simple thing and simply not ride the elephant? Ah, no, the five-year-old won. Here's a couple of ways to get on and off an elephant. No stirrups, no saddles, no ladders. Here we go. You stand up close to the right side of the elephant, right up next to its right shoulder. Never stand next to its left shoulder. I don't know why, but if the mahout tells me not to stand next to the left side of the nine foot tall, five ton elephant, I will take his word for it. 
Now, when you're up this close to an elephant, it's like you're face up against the gray, wrinkly wall. You can't see anything else. You give the command, so, so. And if the elephant doesn't wrap its trunk around your torso and tear you in half, here's what happens. You, the mahout in training, you put your hands up over your head. Put your right hand on top of the right ear. Your left hand, you put it on the gray, wrinkly wall. You grab a handful of elephant skin. It's like heavy, padded canvas. Your elephant lifts his right foot. You put your right foot on the raised right knee. One, two, three, hop. You push down with your right foot. Your elephant boosts you up. Pull on the right ear and the right shoulder. Swing your left leg up and over. You are on an elephant. Congratulations. Here are a couple of other ways to get on and off an elephant. And that is how you get on a working elephant. How do you get on a wild elephant? You don't! I asked why a culture of working elephants had grown in Asia, but not Africa. And I was told that African elephants are too big. They're too aggressive. They're two feet taller. They're two tons bigger. They have names like Vinny. They carry switchblades. Nobody wants to ride them. Elephant was huge. The piece featured video projected on two 90-foot long screens, dance, songs, storytelling, and an enormous elephant puppet. One of the main stories driving the performance was about a circus elephant named Hero. In 1916, there was a bad blizzard. The Elkton uh, the townspeople of Elkton, South Dakota, shot out Hero's eyes and took nine hours to bring him down. 84-year-old Anastasia Gebhardt curates the Elkton Community Museum. She showed me the traveling bag made from Hero's hide. The second thread of the performance grew out of some time I spent at the Thai Elephant Conservation Center in northern Thailand. The first and third world economics around these huge creatures is quite tangled, connecting everything from agriculture to poaching, from tourism to your morning cup of coffee. The living, breathing animal doesn't have a lot to do with uh, the gods and bedtime stories we've turned them into. Along with whales and the great apes, elephants and their sophisticated societies are remarkably similar to ours. Well, okay, but so what? Who cares? What do elephants in Thailand have to do with Illinois or Manhattan and vice versa? How can you get people excited or even to just pay attention to something incomprehensibly vast? You see, by 2050, climate change and our exploding population will push half the species on the planet into extinction. The lions and tigers and bears of our ancient stories will be long gone, central to our myths, embedded in our language, rooted in our imaginations, what will we do when our dreams disappear? I'm trying to find ways of charming people into realizing the complexity and urgency of our situation. I want the, the project to turn people on instead of shutting them down with fear. The unreliable bestiary is using humor, poetics, and plain old wonder to inspire people to live differently. Thanks. <laughs> 